Apapun yang kau perbuat, perbuatlah dengan segenap hatimu Seperti untuk Tuhan dan bukan untuk manusia Kerjakan dengan setia apapun yang ia percayakan Mahkota kehidupan ia janjikan Ia janjikan, ia janjikan bagimu It is 44 BC, and we are just several months after the assassination of Julius Caesar by Brutus and some of the other senatorial leaders who felt that Caesar had deified himself and had ruined and brought low the Republic of Rome. And just several months after the death of Caesar, there were held a number of games in honor of Caesar's life, of his victories, and of his leadership of the Roman people. And these games were very traditional. These were the kinds of things that were done for emperors after their death. Only in this case, in the sky, there was seen a comet streaking across the sky, visible to the naked eye, a comet that is today actually still referred to as Caesar's Comet, or the Star of Caesar. And this comet stayed in the sky for seven full days. And as a result, the Roman people, particularly led by Augustus, Caesar's adopted son, and now the new heir to the Roman Republic, believed that this comet, this star streaking across the sky, was evidence that Caesar himself was now deified, that the gods had seen fit to take him up into the heavenlies and to make him not fully a god, but to make him one with them, that his afterlife would therefore be lived in the presence of the gods perpetually, eternally, deified as a good emperor of Rome who has earned the right to be a part of the pantheon itself. And this comment and this story about Caesar's deification really opens up a door into the world of the Roman pagan life, the Roman pagan understanding of worship. And so in this lecture, we're going to take time to look at Roman pagan life and worship itself. We're going to ask the question, what was it like to worship as a pagan? What would it have been like to participate in the day-to-day -day rituals, in the day-to-day -day establishment of the Roman world? And we are asking these questions not simply for the sake of understanding the historical past, of simply understanding the Greco-Roman world, but the way that the Romans engaged in their religion, not in their faith. Romans are very keen on this. They do not have faith. They have a cultic worship. They have a sacrificial system that pays tribute to the gods and therefore gains benefit to them. And this pagan life, this pagan worship, forms the backdrop of the world that Christianity is born into. Christ, of course, suffers and dies under the Roman establishment. He is nailed to a Roman cross. There is a Roman soldier, the Gospels tells us, at the foot of the cross, commenting on the Messiah on the cross. And the apostles themselves worshipped and spread the faith and evangelized into a Roman world, into a world dominated by this ethos, by this paganism. And so therefore, the more we understand this world, the Roman pagan life and worship, the better we will understand Christianity in the early centuries of the church. And to begin, we have to understand that in this lecture we are looking at day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day worship in the Roman world. In the next lecture we're going to look at pagan philosophy, in particular the Greek philosophy that had come to dominate or at least be associated with parts of the Roman world, and we're going to explore some of those ideas there. Here we are looking specifically at day-to-day -day life in the Roman world. And the first thing we have to say is that pagan worship, pagan practice, was actually very diverse. It is really impossible in some ways to ask the question, what was paganism like in general? Because you have to remember, the Roman world stretched from Britain all the way up in the north, 
down into Spain, comprising most of Europe, and then all the way over to Egypt. And so therefore, when I'm describing paganism in general in this lecture, you have to remember that there are significant varieties and differences as to how that faith was lived out on the ground and in the various cities throughout the Roman world. But nonetheless, some things can be said about paganism in general. And so this sketch is really just sort of a, a composite picture of what we know in general to have occurred in almost all of the areas of the Roman world, with obvious exceptions in certain particularities. And we begin at the home. What would it have been like for the average man or woman, the average family, to have been engaged in pagan life and worship? And in the home, worship begins essentially with the worship and the veneration of one's ancestors. Ancestors for the Romans were called the maiores, the, the greater ones, those who had gone before you. They were very often patriarchal, that is to say you had a founding member of your dynasty, of your family, you had a grandfather, a great-grandfather, someone going back who was considered the originator of your family line. And often what would happen is you would venerate this ancestor. You would offer sacrifices to their name, to the gods, on behalf of the blessing that had been received to your family on their behalf. And so the average home sort of focused on two main areas. On the one hand, you had funeral rites and funeral oaths and certain practices that were associated with the funerals and the locations of the burials of your ancestors. Maybe on the anniversary of their death, maybe on a specific festival time, you would go to the place where your ancestors were buried and you would perform certain obligations, certain oaths were said. You would venerate them. Again, you wouldn't worship your ancestors, but you would venerate them. You would honor their name. You would remember their name. You would recall their great deeds if there were some. Or you would recall the stories of your family and how you had come from a distant past to where you were now. In the home itself, there would often be a shrine of some kind. Now that shrine could be to a deity that was considered to be part of the family household or somehow associated with your family. Maybe it was a deity that your ancestor had worshipped all those years in the past and therefore you as a dutiful son or daughter in the family worshipped and offered incense or other oblations to a deity on behalf of the family itself. And there were all sorts of household gods and deities and obligations of this sort. And these lesser deities, now again, these aren't the big deities. You wouldn't have a shrine in your home necessarily to Jupiter or to Zeus or any of the more powerful, important gods. These would be the lesser deities. But these lesser deities were a pretty important lot. These deities would protect roads. They would protect the hearth in your home, the place where one gathered in the evening, where food was cooked and all these things. The hearth was considered to be the focal point of the house itself, given the obvious need for warmth and food. And a god or a lesser deity was associated with these things very often. And so from the beginning, your home, your family, all that makes you you, at least in terms of the physical DNA of who you are, and in terms of the home where you live, is associated with a veneration of the past, of the antiquity of your elders, as well as doing oblation and performing certain sacrifices to lesser deities on behalf of your family. Now, it needs to be stressed at this point that this was not a personal faith. Again, the Romans do not like the word faith. For them, there is no sense of faith in their cultic worship. Rather, there is obligation. There is a duty. There are sacrifices that need to be made. One could very well not care much at all. You, you don't have to have your heart in it. You don't have to be faithful. You don't have to be full of faith in order to perform these obligations. But these obligations have to be performed. They need to be done in just the right way. If the shrine you have set up in your home calls for a certain oblation of, say, wine or wheat, well, you can't switch it up. You can't decide one day, well, I'm out of wine, I know I'll put something else down, uh, that'll do. Rather, you have to perform the rituals as they are prescribed, and they are prescribed in the foggy past. They, they're not things that you inquire about. Why did we start offering this? Your job as an average man or woman is simply to perform them to not mess them up, to, to do your obligation on behalf of your family. 
And what is gained from doing this is not well-being or a sense of calm or peace in your own psyche. For the average man or woman in pagan Rome, the concern is that by performing these rituals, by performing these sacrifices and venerating the name of your ancestors, that you will get benefit. Again, not personal benefit, not psychological benefit, material benefit is what's in mind here. You will be fertile. You will have lots of children. You will have success in your businesses. You will have success if you are in the military, in battle. And so what is done here is an obligation to the ancestors so that your family, so that your personal lineage can carry on after you have gone your way as well, that, that those that come after you will continue the sacrifices and the obligations to the deities and will venerate your name now, now that you have passed on. And so it is very much wrapped up with the maintenance of the family, maintaining your ancestry, and therefore maintaining your own name as it carries on through your children and your children's children, etc. Moving from the private home worship to that of the city, we come to a more elaborate process and a more elaborate scheme of Roman worship in the pagan world. Cities were very much wrapped up in the day-to-day -day rituals and the year-to-year -year rituals of certain gods that were associated either with that region or with that city, but above all, with the Roman world itself. And cities in this day and age were very much run by the elites, by the decurion classes, by the senatorial classes. If you were part of a relatively large city, or even a moderately sized city, there would be all kinds of gradations of those who were at the elite status, always broken down according to one's material possessions. If you were part of the senatorial classes, you were at the, the high end, you had the most wealth, the most prestige, and it carried down into a number of different ranks below it. The decurion classes, the equestrian classes, and, and so on and so forth. And we don't have to belabor the point and break down society into all these ranks. But just know that at the top end, there are these elites in Rome. There are these leaders who are the principal contributors to the city itself. And those ranks are the most important factors in shaping and maintaining pagan worship in a city and maintaining the cult that is surrounding these gods. And we'll see more of that in just a second, but you need to know that it is the elites that are the most important classes in this period of time. And so in cities, you would have a number of avenues for offering sacrifices. The first place you'd come to in a given city would be to a temple. Now, a temple is not a pagan version of a church. There would be no temple that would function like a church in the sense that a congregation or a collected body would come there on a regular basis, daily, weekly, monthly, or even yearly. The temples were the homes of the gods themselves. They are the specific locations where the gods would reside. And so very often it would not be the place where people would want to go and hang out and be in fellowship with one another. So the Temple of Artemis, for example, just on the outskirts of Ephesus, well, that is the home of the god Artemis. It is where she has her principal location, her principal home. And so these temples become the focal points of the divine presence in a specific location in a city. Their architecture is very often common. There's often a lot of columns in the front. It is very much considered to be a holy area. In fact, the, the, the demarcation between the city itself and the temple location was considered to be crossing from the mundus, from the world, into something of a divine strip of land or to a divine presence. And so those who were responsible for offering sacrifices to Artemis or to any of a number of other gods in other temples could be any of a number of different people. Not a lot of these temples had priestly classes. That is to say, there weren't always priests living in these temples day in and day out, performing the rituals on behalf of the people. Now, in some cases, that is what is happening. But in general, the temple was the place where the city itself came to offer a sacrifice on, a, on an appropriate occasion, on an obligatory occasion when a sacrifice was due. And at times, indeed in most cases, it would be the decurion classes or the elites, even the senatorial classes who would be engaged in offering the sacrifice. 
Now, they would often be aided by priests or by those who were knowledgeable of the cultic rituals and the appropriate way when you need to zig instead of zag uh, and these kinds of things. But the focal point of what is driving this are the elite classes. And there would be other things as well. Throughout the year, again, depending on your city, depending on the rituals that have been established uh, in the past, you would have festivals. At certain points, you would have a festival to this god. At another time of the year, you'd have a festival to that god. And each god, each deity, had its own requirements for how the festivals were to be engaged, how they were to be conducted. And one of the most important things about a festival, though, again, to to signal this, is when the elites were in charge of the festivals, very often during one of these festivals, there would be a distribution of goods, a giving out of maybe gold coins or bronze coins um, uh, on behalf of this festival. The elite classes would pay to have certain coins struck, and then those in the city who came out would get a distribution of this wealth. And the festival itself, then, was an instrumental part of the city and the distribution of wealth, and it was very, very popular. Again, if you're on the lower ranks of society, if money is not something that is uh, easily gotten by you, if you're not uh, a landed person with lots of wealth supporting you, if you are not part of the elites, to come to a festival and then to receive gifts on behalf of the festival, on behalf of the god, was a very good thing in your mind. Another element of city worship would be any of a number of different processions. Now, a procession is a more specific and a more particular element of worship on the public level. Generally, what would happen is a statue to the god of some kind would very often be paraded through the city or paraded through a certain set of paths throughout the city, again, based on an obligation to whatever deity is being worshipped. And that god would then be processed, often to the theater or to the amphitheater in the city. And then again, a certain ritual, a certain process would then be engaged by the elites in seeking favor of this god. Now, the most important thing for the average worshiper or for the city itself was the taking of oaths or vows before the deity. It would be a very specific process. The goal of the average person was not to be ecstatic. It was not to be actually extremely heartfelt. In fact, according to Roman practice and Roman belief, to be overly exuberant, to be really passionate, almost fervent, is to be superstitious. Superstitio for a Roman is to seek to own the God and to force the God to do things, usually through exuberance or through ecstatic experiences. Above all, the worst thing that one could do, according to a Roman, would be to lose one's mind, to go into maybe a trance, uh, unless, of course, you were appointed by this, unless you were a priestess of some cult of some kind. But the Romans always looked at cults in which people lost their minds, lost their, their senses, in which they were controlled by the gods. They had a poor view of these things. And again, you're going to see how Christianity is going to mess with this even now. Christianity is very much about being heartfelt, about worshiping and loving their Lord. Now, it is not about controlling the Lord, and it's not about uh, having superstition in that sense, but the Romans do not believe that one necessarily has to be passionate or heartfelt or exuberant for their faith. What matters is doing the rituals the right way and in the right order. Now, all of this in general, home worship and worship in the cities, is really buttressed and supported by a central feature of the Roman world, and that is the cult of the emperor. The cult of the emperor, if it had not existed, might very well have allowed all of the varieties of pagan worship in all of the sectors and all of the regions of Rome to kind of become their own little Galapagos islands of different faiths, and they might have been shaped and developed in hundreds of different ways, if not thousands. But the core of all of this, if you were a Roman, if you were in a Roman city or a Roman village, all of these worship functions were designed to promulgate and support the emperor himself. All of these were designed to venerate and to support the cult of the emperor as the focal point of the Roman state. Now, a couple of myths have to be dispelled at this point. At no point in the Roman world were Roman emperors believed to be deities on their own. They were never considered to be gods. 
Rather, there is a syncretism effect that occurs as Rome and before her Greece has engaged with Asia Minor and picked up some of the elements of emperor veneration that you see in Persia, in the realms of Egypt with the veneration of the pharaohs, and so on and so forth. And as we've already seen in the Greek world, that when Alexander went out east, one of the things that he picks up is just this sort of thing. The Persian belief that the leader, the emperor, is somehow on a good footing with the gods. He's a friend of the gods. Well, the Roman policy had very much been adopted from the Greek policy. And the Roman policy really has two focal points. On the one hand, there is syncretism, and on the other, there is henotheism. And both of these are vital to understand. Most students, when they first come to church history and they notice that the Roman world, if it conquered a region and there were a variety of new deities or deities that seemed somewhat similar to deities that were already in the Roman pantheon, it strikes us as somewhat strange that the Romans would say, okay, the gods we don't know, we'll take those. And uh, those gods over there, they look like these gods over here, so we'll just kind of slap Roman names on them, and uh, this god is now Jupiter, this god is now Saturn, etc. Well, what is behind that, again, is syncretism and henotheism. Syncretism, of course, is a word we're probably familiar with. It is the belief, of course, that as the Roman world goes out, it wants to merge its culture of Roman worship with the cultures that are now conquered. And so as the Romans go out, they want to do this. They see this as an appropriate act. Again, if you, if you believe in a pantheon of the gods, if you believe in a diverse number of the gods, well, adding more to the list really isn't all that much of a problem to you. More important, though, is one thing that is often overlooked, and that is the Roman belief in henotheism. Now, henotheism is the belief that you have one god who might very well show up to a tribe on the far-flung areas of the Roman borders in a different guise. He might look slightly different. He might be depicted in their art or in their literature as somewhat different from the god that they had known in their context. And for the Romans, that was perfectly normal. Zeus or Jupiter is very much able and very much free to go to another tribe or to another people group and to present himself in his own way. And so when the Romans conquered a new tribe or whenever they came across new deities... They expected to find this. They expected to find similarities between the gods of a local tribe and the gods that they had worshipped all along, at least from as far back as they can remember. And so, in other words, the Romans were not being cynical. They were not just simply trying to accommodate their now-conquered subjects. Rather, this was a doctrinal position, if you want to put it that way. This was a philosophical assumption that their gods, the big ones in particular, the, the, the main gods would be associated and found in regions that they had not yet explored. It's not the case, in other words, that the Romans practiced syncretism or believed in henotheism because they wanted simply to accommodate the people that they had conquered. Rather, for the Romans to take over a region to get these other gods or their own gods who had appeared to these areas under different names or in different raiments, the goal for the Roman is to conquer to bring all these gods to bear so that all of the power in all of these regions that they conquer are now supporting Rome. Again, it's not accommodation, it's subjugation. The Romans believe that if they've conquered, then those gods are now in their pantheon and are now supporting them. Now, it is because of this idea that the Roman world is conquering deities as well as people groups all around their borders that one of the most important places for worship of the gods, if there is any place that is more fervent than anywhere else, it is in the army. The army in the Roman world is always the place where the worship and the sacrifices to the gods is most fervent. Why? Well, the Roman soldiers and the generals and all up the ranks know that if the gods are on their side, they will have success in battle. And much of the Roman belief in its own military might and its ability to smash anybody in the mythology of the Roman army that it had never lost on its home turf and that it very rarely lost, they believed, when it was at full strength in marching out against their enemies. A lot of that was supported by this belief in the conquering and the good blessing of all the deities that are associated with the Roman pantheon. And so the army is very much a hotbed for Roman worship. 
And keep that in mind when we move forward, particularly when we get to the lectures on the third century crisis. The worst persecutions we will see of Christians occur not in the early years of the Christian faith, as is commonly assumed, but actually a good bit later, in the third century and on into the early years of the fourth century, just on the eve of Constantine coming to the throne. The worst persecution of Christians come as a result of the fact that the emperor, the one who is in charge of Rome, is very often, in almost every case, drawn from the military ranks. And those military officers who became emperors and enacted the worst persecutions very much did so based on this belief that in order to return Rome to its position of strength and dominance, you had to impose a specific ritual order onto the populace again in order to curry the favor of the gods. In the earlier years, though, the imperial cult is supreme. It is believed that Roman people are venerating the genius of the emperor. Now, that is a technical word, the genius of the emperor, the the inspiration that he has received from the gods. The emperor has a certain insight, a certain wisdom, a certain tactical maneuvering that he has been granted by the gods as a result of all the sacrifices. Now, this begins, some say, with Augustus, going back again to the comet streaking across the sky in 44 BC, and Augustus choosing to promulgate the idea that Julius has now risen the ranks and has now been accepted under the presence of the gods. But again, actually, this goes back to Alexander. This idea of the deification and the veneration of the emperor comes as a result of the Greek world meshing with the Persian world and the Egyptian world. And all of these ancient Near Eastern ideas of kingship begin to work their fingers into the thinking of first the Greeks and then later into the Romans. But Augustus, after the death of Julius, is very much on the forefront of institutionalizing this idea. He initiates the idea that Julius needs to be venerated as one who has received this genius from the gods. But again, at the fundamental level, at the root level, the main thing that is driving the emperor worship of the Roman world is not so much that it is being imposed from the top down. The amount of geography that Rome has to cover means that very often imposing too much from the top down is not as easy as it sounds. They may send out a decree saying that all of the Roman peoples need to engage in emperor cultic worship and venerating the emperor, but good luck imposing that on all people. Rather, as historians have always pointed out, at the local level, at the city level, those who were the elites at the local levels wanted to impose and to support and to stoke up the veneration of the emperor. Why? Well, the simple reason is those who do this, those who are elites in the small cities who strongly support the veneration of the emperor, have opened to them a number of paths to elevation. If you pursue the veneration of the emperor, very often what you would do is you would request that the emperor would grant a city a right to do these things. And so we have all kinds of letters going back and forth from the elites to the central hub of government. And as you can imagine, in not a few cases, the the emperor was very happy with this. And so you would see favor, political favor, come to those who were most zealous about supporting the Roman emperor. And so in other words, all of the theology, again, if you want to call it that, it's not really a theology, but all of the impulses of the Roman world and the Roman pagan life and worship drove a hard line towards the Roman state and towards the Roman machine of war. Those who support the government, those who support the Roman state, those who support and do their obligations to the gods are supporting, in their own small way, the enduring success of Rome against its enemies. Now, to conclude, how does this Roman life and worship interact with Christianity, or with Judaism for that matter? And there is actually two opinions by the Romans on this. When the Romans come across the Jews for the first time, they are actually a bit suspicious of them. They, they don't like the fact that the Jews are strict monotheists, that they will not allow Yahweh to be in any way associated with any of the deities in the Roman pantheon, and they will not, under any circumstances, sacrifice to the gods. Still, the Jews have one thing in their advantage. They have an ancient faith. And there is nothing more that the Romans like than a faith that is ancient. 
An ancient faith is a good one, and what the Jews have above all else is they have a chronology that goes back centuries before the Roman Empire even came on the scene. And so therefore the Romans respected the Jews. At an arm's length they respected them. They still thought they were strange. But at one point the Jews are given a certain leeway in their worship. The Jews would be allowed to worship Yahweh in their own fashion, in their own way, so long as they pray for the emperor. If they pray to Yahweh on behalf of the emperor, then the Jews would be left alone. Now, that is a tense relationship that is going to come to all kinds of problems, not least in AD 70 when Rome destroys Jerusalem after a revolt amongst the Jews. The Christians, though, according to the Romans, are not considered to be attached to Judaism at all. Now, we can quibble with them about their understanding of Old Testament and New Testament connections. But nonetheless, for the Romans, Christians were a new faith. And if Judaism was hailed and um, respected by the Romans because it was old, nothing makes a Roman more suspicious than a new religion, a new faith. And so according to the Romans, the Christians were a new faith. They had just come on the scene, again, centuries after even the Romans were established. And so therefore, the Christians were very often barred from worship because they were new, they were considered to be atheists, they would not accept the gods, and it was not believed that they had any justification for rejecting worship and veneration of the emperor. And so as we move forward into the earliest centuries and the earliest decades, for that matter, of the Christian church, just after the apostolic age, the main thing we'll see is that the Romans believe that the Christians are somewhat dangerous, but more importantly, they believe Christianity is weak. They believe that the Christians are willing to suffer and die for their faith, and that's crazy. For the Romans, if your God is strong, if you are worshiping a true God, one of the strongest in the pantheon, well, why isn't that God protecting you when we're throwing you to the lion's den or nailing you to crosses? The idea of suffering for a Roman as a result of your worship of a deity is completely oxymoronic. The worship of a deity is to gain strength and power. And therefore, as we'll see in the next lecture when we turn to the subject of persecutions in the earliest centuries of the church, What we'll see is that the Romans have no category for Christianity. Why will the Christians not support the state? Why won't they just come to these sacrifices? They don't have to believe it. Why won't you just offer a pinch of incense? It doesn't mean anything, the Romans will think. And why do they reject our gods? Why do they think that their God is the only one? And why are they so new? Who are these Christians? And so when we turn in a later lecture to look at persecutions, one of the things we're going to see is that the Roman world and the Christian world are simply oil and water. They do not connect. They do not mix. They are different understandings of the religious life, of the life of faith. And so therefore, for centuries, until the coming of Constantine and the conversion of the emperor himself, Christianity and Roman pagan life are simply incompatible.